and we're live. All right. For anyone who has been listening so far, welcome back to the Talking Average Fitness Podcast. And if this is your first time here, because you saw previously that somehow we conned Pat Barber into showing up onto the show, surprise, that was a one-time deal. Um, it's yeah. just us again. So as always, my name is Sam Burns, and I'm joined by my very, very tall, very redheaded compatriot, Mr. Kevin McCarthy. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fantastic, Sam. How are you today? I'm killing it, crushing life, just feeling super stoked to be here. Um, so for those of you who, who we haven't like spoiled, um, the, spoiled the surprise for, we have a, a giant Google Doc sheet of just topic after topic after topic after topic. And it's, a lot of them are just like ranty type things. And this one is kind of ranty, oh, but yeah. not, not well, maybe it's a little ranty. It's going to get a little ranty. It's going to get a little ranty, and that's okay. It's <laughs> but but it, it, buried in it is a very, very important question. And it's not asked, after, asked often enough. So the, the topic is, why do you train? Why do you do CrossFit, right? And yeah, I'm sure we're going to talk about our own experiences and you know, why we do these things, but also why we, you know, some of our clients come in and do some of the things that they do. And then maybe some of the pitfalls of either not having an answer to that question or to having a very superficial answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of stepping back, probably a good place to start was just with you and I. You know, mm -hmm. you've, you've been in the CrossFit game a little bit longer than I have, but we're both as professional coaches, you know, in a unique position. You know, why do you still do CrossFit? Tell us. That's a, that's a great question. You know, it's probably a question that, you know, we joke about that, you know, you come in, you do this thing, CrossFit, and it's uncomfortable, it causes me physical, mental, and emotional pain. But yeah, we'll see you guys again tomorrow and we'll do it all over again. <laughs> um, and I think for me, the reason why I really enjoy it and keep showing up every day is I really enjoy kind of finding my thresholds and pushing what I'm capable of. And you know, uh, we had touched on it in our kind of our intro thing. I have a really, really hard time not being good at whatever it is I'm doing. And there's a part of me that wants to be kind of the best person in the room at whatever it is I'm doing. Right. So if, if I stepped onto an ultimate Frisbee field, you better bet that I'm going to try as best I can to be the best ultimate Frisbee player on that field. Right. Um, so I really enjoy pushing my limits, what I can do and trying to be the best I can be. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just, I enjoy, I'll put myself in as much of a hurt locker working out by myself with no music as I will in a group or in a class with people around you kind of pushing you and, and good energy. So I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. And that's what kind of keeps me coming back at, at kind of the foundation of that. Um, along with that kind of like, I'm too competitive to not compete occasionally. I'm dealing with a hip injury right now, but I, I'm way too competitive to, to not throw my hat in the ring for some things. So, sure. you know, I also enjoy competing in CrossFit at what, you know, the highest level I can. I've done a bunch of local competitions, you know, the open, um, and then now quarterfinals, um, is incredibly fun. I've been to Wadapalooza on a team, um, right before the Rona hit, um, decent to fair chance that our team brought the Rona to Florida. So, you know, do with that, what you do with that, what you will. Um, was, was Hobart part of that? Can we blame him for that? No, we didn't make it to Wadapalooza with Hobart. Um, it's uh, we, we tried a team of three last year mm, um, oh, that's right, that's and right. it was, it was the perfect storm of James hadn't trained for a while. Cause work, you know, he had gone and taken second at the CrossFit games as one does. Right. Um, Casual. <laughs> and then had basically had to like backlog all of his work while he was training for the games. <laughs> and so <laughs> he had a lot of work to do. He like, hadn't really trained in six months and he's like, ah, let's give it a go. And then, wow. uh, I got, I got sick, like the flu or a nasty virus, or something during the qualifier week. And then our yep. third teammate, Frank was, uh, doing finals in school. So it was the yeah. perfect storm of just got rocked. And so yep. we were, uh, we were six points shy of qualifying for Wadapalooza. Mm -hmm. Um, which was a bit of a bummer, but, uh, it was okay. okay. Um, so yeah, I, you know, those, those are kind of my, my whys. I kind of at the base level, I really enjoy pushing myself and seeing what I'm capable of and what I can do and uh, love to kind of push that boundary as best I can. And I, I, I use that to then enjoy competing in CrossFit. Um, but even if I never stepped foot on a competition floor again, I would still be going bonkers in the gym 
doing the stuff we enjoy doing because I, I really do love it and enjoy it on, on the day to day for sure. How about yourself, Sam? Why do you CrossFit? Why do I CrossFit? Well, so we established in the last episode that we are nerds and very much so, very much so. So I, I mean, I've said before, I started CrossFit because someone showed me how you can do a math equation and explain fitness or power output in a CrossFit workout, right? Because we had mm-hmm. these very careful definitions of these things. Yep. And so I do CrossFit because I don't have to justify anything to anyone in terms of like why I did the thing that I did. What is important to me is like work capacity is a very objective measurement. And if I want to be fit and, you know, like I, I got into CrossFit because like I was 30 years old and, you know, the most working out I had ever done had been Little League Baseball when I was 12 or whatever. So like I needed, like I understood that like I needed to do something with my body and I didn't want to waste my time. And, you know, God help us, even 20 years into the CrossFit experiment, there is still an insane amount of bullshit on the internet in terms of like... (laughs) Like I think like, I think that can be said about just the internet in general. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not exactly <laughs> like narrowing things down there, but right. like specific to fitness, like there's an insane yeah. amount of fitness bullshit on the internet in terms of like things that people do that they think will quote unquote get them fitter, right? And so what attracted me to CrossFit is the fact that we've stripped away the subjective nature of it, right? So there is work capacity. If you do these things and your work capacity goes up, hey, your fitness increased. I like that. I, pre- I appreciate that. Um, and so... Kevin's in the middle of the, middle of the discussion. Sorry. It's, no, it's okay. And so for me, I do it because I know these things move the needle. Because I know what the needle looks like. I've defined the needle and like I can literally watch it, right? And now, several years in, I am fitter at 37 years old than I ever have been in my life. I am continuing to increase my level of fitness. And that's not a subjective statement. That's an objective statement because I have data to support it, measurable, observable, repeatable data. And... I am beginning to see at 37 years old and with a 20 month old child, like how important this is going to be for the next 10 years, 20 years to remain physically capable. And I haven't come across anything that touches all of the bases in a sufficiently varied and, um, even manner as CrossFit has. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like we, like we, you know, like we, dis- like we discussed previously, if you can show me on an equation how skateboarding backwards in a tutu is going to do it and like move that needle, cool, I'll do that. But until then, I'm going to do the thing that works because I know it works and not because I feel like it works. I mean, I think there's only one way to find out if skateboarding backwards in a tutu is effective is we have to try it. I think well, there's only one way to figure that out. Well, we got to have standards. And so now it's a whole other rabbit hole. Um, oh, what man. kind of tutu? <laughs> what color? Oh, are, are, do long boards count? Anyway, so that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And uh, kind of what I hear when I hear you talk about it is, you know, you've got this, you know, as a, as a competitive athlete, this background where it's, you like to push yourself, you know, mm-hmm. at, a, at, a, at a deep core level. And it's not just CrossFit. It would be, like, as you say, frisbee football or whatever. Yep. You like to push yourself. You like to see what you're capable of and to push on those boundaries as much as possible. Um, Taking into account kind of our previous discussion with Mr. Pat Barber, mm-hmm. like, how old are you again? 27. So you're 27, right? So 
yep. 10 years difference between the two of us, for better or for mm -hmm. worse. How long do you see yourself capable of continuing to do that? Like forecast into the future a little bit. Yeah. You mean like, like how long do you think I can continue to push myself the way I currently do? Yeah, let's, let's, use, like yeah, let's use your current, like hip injury aside, right? So yep. your current metric of attempting to be a, a like what I would call an above average competitive, com competitive CrossFitter, right? If you make mm -hmm. it, you know, past the open onto the next stage or you make it to Wadapalooza, mm -hmm. like, like you've established yourself as an above average competitive CrossFitter. How much longer do you see yourself doing something like that? If you've thought about that. So I haven't really thought about, you know, when, when I would kind of quote unquote stop competing. Cause I think there will be a part of me forever. That's always going to want to kind of push that envelope. Um, you know, that 65 plus division at the games is I'm coming for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 2052. Here we come. <laughs> let's, let's get it. You know how long I have to train for that, Sam, I'm going to be a monster at that point. Um, but I haven't really put like kind of a, you know, when it goes from crossfitting as I currently do to, you know, maybe dialing it back just a bit and like, you know, throw my hat in a ring for like a local competition if I feel so inclined, but not, you know, feeling the overwhelming urge to do so. I'm not sure when that will happen. I'm kind of just playing it by ear because also, I mean, bring it to um, not as like an excuse, but I'd like have been dealing with like a hip kind of lower back injury deal and we're working on it. It's getting better. Um, but there's a whole lot of kind of movement pattern things, just some suboptimal movement that was happening back there that has led to a kind of a prolonged injury, just kind of like all built up. And then as it happens, it, now you have to kind of like work your way through all of that to, to fix it. And so it's, it's definitely getting better. Um, but, uh, I completely just lost my train of thought. What was I saying before? <laughs> How long do you think you'll be doing competitive cross? Oh, um, so like, as long as injuries aside, as long as I am staying relatively healthy and able to continue doing it, I'll keep doing it. Um, but if this injury never kind of like fully resolves itself, let's say I'm never able to, it, it seems to be back squats that are the big thing that kind of set it off or bug it. Um, mm -hmm. And so in my head the other day, I was like, maybe I just don't ever back squat again. You know, maybe it's just every time back squats come up in class or come up in a programming or whatever it is, you know, I just swap it to a front squat. I'm, I've always been more comfortable front squatting than I ever have been back squatting. Um, when I was competing in weightlifting, like I always preferred front squat sessions over back squat sessions. Like it was just a more comfortable movement pattern for me yep. and for my body and the whole thing. It's like, maybe that just is what it is. I never back squat again. Do I think you can still be incredibly fit and healthy and happy human being mm. without ever back squatting? Sure. You're still getting below parallel. You're still building strength, your lower body and midline and the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and maybe that just is what it is. Um, does that take me out of the running for competing at a high level? Maybe. Right. Um, but it's, it, if that were the case, if it was like, okay, this hip thing's just never, ever going to go away. It's always going to be something that I just live with in some way, shape or form and that takes me out of competing, then that's okay. Like I still enjoy doing what I do in the gym every day and working out with people that I work out with. Um, and I can still push myself in the ways that I can. And maybe it just kind of makes it so I can never squat clean, super heavy or back squat crazy heavy ever again. And that's, you know, I'm, mentally I'm, I'm okay with that. So I don't really have kind of a time stamp on when that is. If, if I can keep it going, I'll keep it going. If, if it's time to dial it back, we'll dial it back. Well, and I, I think that's a, that's a very appropriate response. And I, and I, and I asked it that way because I feel like there's a lot of people in or around your situation in terms of both age demographics and experience level or capacity level like maybe more than ever, there is a, <clears throat> a contingent of 20-somethings or early 30-somethings who are tremendously fit because they got into CrossFit at the right time and they've reaped mm -hmm. the benefits and they've been smart with their training. And so, like, yeah, we got a bunch of, like, you know, quarterfinal level, essentially, athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a handful at more gyms than not in North America. And 
you know, we talked so many, so many good nuggets out of that Pat Barber discussion, talking about like, you know, competitive CrossFit or CrossFit to get better at CrossFit. It kind of being a trade-off, right? So like, you know, competitive athletes are training long-term physical health and longevity for shorter-term physical dominance, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like there's, you know, more, more than there ever has been people who are in your position who are, you know, they love CrossFit, they love competition, they love the way it feels, they love doing what they do. And as I, I feel like it would be irresponsible of me as a trainer if I didn't ask them, cool, what's your five or 10 year plan? Mm -hmm. You know, like how long are you willing to smash your face against the wall? Essentially? <laughs> because, yep. I mean, that's, you know, higher level competitive CrossFit there is a certain amount of smash your face against a wall. Oh yeah. I, it's, it definitely, it, and, and there, there are some levels and I think there's comes, you know, learning yourself as an athlete and there's Hopefully. some trial and error that comes with that. Um, Cause certain people respond to different things differently. But I mean, if as a whole, if you are pursuing competitive CrossFit at whatever level, if you're, if you're pushing the envelope on what your body can do, and really trying to drive adaptation that way, there is always like, you're always a little bit beat up, always a little bit sore. You know, it's just, you know, you walk and you're like, it's just things are sore and that's just kind of becomes your normal because yeah. you, the thing with is like, as you kind of layer on mm -hmm. training pieces, as you layer on volume, hopefully in an appropriate manner, but I know we'll dive into that as yeah. well you know, as you layer on more training pieces and more volume, the, the opportunity for variance is much less. The more frequently you're training and the more training pieces you're doing, the less time you have between certain movement patterns or loading ranges, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so, I mean, if you're training cross it competitively, you are probably getting below parallel in a loaded fashion at least three times per week, if not more, whether that's in a lifting session, a Metcon or both, um, you are pressing overhead three times a week or more, mm -hmm. either loaded or body weight or both. Yep. Um, so it's, you know, that's a lot of stress on your tissues, your joints, your nervous system, mm -hmm. again, your thoughts and your feelings, um, mm -hmm. as you're going through and it, it, definitely takes a toll so there is that trade-off there it's it does take a lot whether you are if you're actually kind of pursuing it whether you're at a games level or you're just like hey i really really enjoy these little competitions and being as fit and prepared as i can for them so that's why i train more if you're doing that it's a lot regardless of the level of competitor you currently are right yeah even even attempting to go down that road is yep. You know, and you know, this is the, the double-edged sword is the further CrossFit progresses, the further it progresses the sport of CrossFit, which further progresses CrossFit as a methodology, yep. or at least how it's being expressed in so many, uh, in so many affiliates. Yep. Um, and so I, it does, it kind of becomes this physical arms race between what what the end range or the like the end of the spectrum of physical capability is mm -hmm. and what is being asked of people sometimes people who are there and willingly pursuing competitive crossfit sometimes not if an affiliate is not careful about how they're prescribing loading or how they're prescribing volume um mm -hmm. and and then there's the, the kind of like the subjective emotional nature. Um, and I've talked with, I don't know how many hundreds of clients at this point who they've got a someone, a person who is either at their box or someone they follow on the internet, on TikTok or on Instagram. And this person is a, a motivational driver for the athlete. And it doesn't matter if it's 
from a performance standpoint or from an aesthetic standpoint, um, the natural comparison that we make in our mind between, you know, like, so like from me to you, you know, I observe you, Kevin, as you present yourself on the outside, and I compare it to me, Sam, and how I feel on the inside, right? And my experience, unless you have a tremendously healthy person from an emotional standpoint, the great majority of people always, when they make those types of comparisons, they find their own selves lacking. And sometimes that can fuel um, a healthy kind of pursuit. Um, sometimes it can fuel a disordered kind of pursuit. And a lot of that depends on many, many, many other circumstances, of course. But, you know, I, yeah, it's just imagining keeping up with you hurts. It hurts me <laughs> right now to think about. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I like to tell people, so I used to run the on-ramp program, the new athlete program at the first affiliate that I worked at. And mm -hmm. occasionally you'd get people who would come in and they'd, they'd be, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of building rapport and, you know, I'm asking them what they know about CrossFit. And at some point they say something along the lines of, you know, I'm not looking to get, you know, I'm not looking to get competitive or anything. Mm -hmm. And internally, we as trainers, we might kind of chuckle and say, no shit. You know, like, yeah. but the reality is, is most people have no idea the level of training and the volume of training mm -hmm. that serious competitive athletes put in. Yep. And that was one of the, the benefits of being at that affiliate is the guy who ran that was a seminar staff member and a competitive CrossFitter at the time, Spencer Hendel. Mm -hmm. I got to see firsthand the level of training he put himself through yeah. and I'm not interested in that yeah. at all. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's, it's, it really is incredible. I mean, yes. I had a similar sort of experience at one nation where, um, James Hobart was going for, he, he had taken the 2017 season off after winning two championships, at the games with CrossFit mayhem. Mm -hmm. Um, he took the 2017 season off. Um, didn't compete, didn't, I mean, he did the open from like a, you know, uh, community standpoint in true James fashion, had his highest worldwide finish ever in a year that he wasn't trained to compete. Right. As one does. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, he's so frustrating. Um, but he, 2018, he was like, I'm going to give it another go and I'm going to have, I'm going to, you know, go one more year as an individual, kind of like, you know, close the, close the chapter, close that, you know, that book off. And so he was training for, he'd qualified for regionals in 2018. Um, hashtag, and that RIP regionals. Yeah. RIP regionals. Although they're like, they're kind of coming back. They're calling it semifinals, but it's like kind of regionals. It is. I'm excited. It's, it's, although it makes the sport way more, man, we like slide. We'll get back to you in a sec. Side tangent. <laughs> the semifinals structure right now is like, if there were X amount of spots at semifinals, now the region is bigger yeah, but the spots are the same, so now it's going to be way more competitive. And I know they they've given like depending on like how competitive the field is, they'll like yeah. you know hand out some extra invites if you go to. I mean, it was like the Central East region, um, how it used to be is like they, you know, so many heavy hitters in that region that they kind of awarded it some more spots a couple of years of the games. Yeah. Um, they have that kind of structure going on, but still, it's like now it's so much more. It's instead of competing against. 40 people for five spots. You're now competing against 80. I haven't looked yeah. at the numbers that closely, so I could be wrong. So don't anyone on the internet roast me or do, sure. but what um, it's, <laughs> you're now competing against 80 people for those same five spots. So um, it's going to be way more competitive, the semifinal field, which is going to be interesting. Anyways, back to James. Okay. He was competing at the 2018 regionals or he had qualified for it. And there was an event in there that was muscle ups, handstand walk ramp, and pistols yeah and it was the first time i think they had done the ramp at regionals which is basically if you haven't seen it or know about it there's a literal ramp on the way up and then stairs on the way back down and you had to kind of go up and down two obstacles over the course of i believe it was like a 30 or 40 foot distance mm -hmm. so james is training for that 
And in typical us fashion, we were like, we're just going to make shift the sketchiest ramp and stair situation ever so known many to me. athletes did that oh my god well because the ramp itself cost like two thousand dollars right like, and you could only buy it from like one provider because the there was only one manufacturer at the time yeah um and so we like with plates mm -hmm. and a foldable plastic t table oh god we we built our ramp and staircase for James to train on. And it's in the corner of the gym. And like, we'd, we'd each tried it and like, you know, made it up or down a couple successful times. Well, yeah. during one of James's training sessions, uh, unfortunately he fell off said ramp and broke his foot. Um, Ooh. and so there went his regionals thing. But during that kind of time, as he was training for regionals, he was really going at it. Yeah. Um, and myself and another one of our coaches, Lachlan, are like, we're going to train with James. Like, can't let a homie train alone. Like, we're going right. to get after with him. Sure. I think I, I made it. And again, I trained more than your normal person yeah. already. Yeah. And then trying to level up to James training for a competition, a 10-time games athlete or like an eight-time games athlete training for competition. I, I made it three days. <laughs> and I was like, I'm moving. I'm going somewhere else. I right. don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> like, so I quit. This and this needs to be said. This isn't talked about often enough. We're not just talking about loading or volume. We're talking about intensity. Oh my gosh! As well, that's, and like that's yeah. Like, imagine, you know, and everybody's got like a workout recently that they remember. If you did it right, it's probably some 15 minute AMRAP of some sort, right? Or maybe it's five rounds for time, but similar time yeah, domain. Somewhere 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, like short enough that you could really kind of push the pace, but long enough for you to regret every life choice that led you there. <laughs> Imagine like going 50% or 100% greater on the volume and going an order of magnitude more difficult in the skill work and going as hard mm -hmm. and just like not yep. stopping. Like every time you would go to the chalk bucket for emotional support, you don't, and you just go to the barbell. Yep. And, you know, uh, what's his name? Hacksaw. Uh, Tommy Hackenbrook? Tom, Tommy yeah, Tommy Hackenbrook. Yep. Tommy Hackenbrook is famous for saying, you don't need a harder workout. You need to go harder yep, in your workouts. You need workout. to go harder in your workouts. Yep. And Greg Glassman said, be impressed by intensity, not volume. Right. So, that, I mean, taking it all the yep. way back to the L1. Right. Yeah. So, getting after it at that level with, you know, and we can talk about James and, you know, how he's essentially constructed by an alien race to do CrossFit. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> if, if you don't know who James Hobart is, if on, you just going to solve this real quick. One second. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, does Sam has it have a picture of James? So if you're, if you're listening to this and not audio booking, I'm sorry, but this guy's James Hobart. If you crack James. open, yeah, if you crack yep. open the level one manual, he's the guy who squats and look like his looks like his back is sitting against a wall. Yeah, you know, like he's, he's the the most beautiful man in, with the most beautiful squat. Um, if if you are just listening to this podcast, if, imagine the most beautiful man doing the most beautiful squat, and that's yeah. most, and then make it more beautiful in both <laughs> regards, and that's James. We got to tag James um, in this, but <laughs> we, we do got to tag James, but it's it. You're exactly right. It wasn't just the volume or the loading, although there is that present, there was also the intensity there. And that's where, I know this is another, you know, we'll continue talking about it. that's where most, you know, competitors or aspiring competitors start to lack yeah. is adding on extra volume at the expense of intensity. Yeah. And that's where you kind of can shortchange yourself where you have the person who trains a lot but then they do the open and they get absolutely waxed by your yeah. affiliate member who just shows up and takes class and goes really hard. And you're like, yeah. well, he only takes class five days per week and you train four hours a day and something happened there. Uh, <laughs> that's the, you, know, you know, not, not saying anything there it was, uh, um, you, you see it happen. You know, you have the, the athlete who's the aspiring competitor is like, I'm going to follow X program and train three or four hours a day. And they're kind of just like, going through the motions, checking boxes. And it's like, yeah, you're accumulating all the volume and maybe there's some experiences there, but then yeah. you get absolutely demolished by the athlete that shows up to class with a can do attitude yeah. and just crushes it each day. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that was James every single, I mean, it was show up at the gym in the morning, like eight or so in the morning. We had a gap between classes. You train for an hour and a half or so. He would then go eat lunch and like, you know, stretch, roll out, do like whatever kind of recovery stuff that you do. Um, come back afternoon class now one o'clock do another like you know one hour to two you know one to one and a half hour session or so eat some food foam roll stretch again like do some recovery maybe like you know a little power nap in the back Mm -hmm. coach a couple classes and then train again and it's like it was the the schedule the discipline of it but also the intensity so imagine you're doing three workouts or, you know, three Metcons during your thing. And the third one is Fran. But the rule is you have to PR your Fran on that third. Like, that's what we're kind of talking about is like, that would be so brutal. It'd be horrible. That If you don't PR Fran, you lose. If you don't PR your Fran, you, you, you have to start your training day over again, try again. Um, and so that was the level of intensity that was each. And that's why it's so hard to keep up with. Cause of course, when you're training with people, you're going to go harder. Sure. And that was the hardest thing was like the level of intensity. You just couldn't, you couldn't maintain it. And, you know, he has spent year, like a decade building the capacity to tolerate that. So people that can handle that at that level have earned the right to do so by doing two things. One, generally they move very well. They're very efficient movers, their movement patterns, and they, they stand on a near unshakable foundation of movement quality. Yes. From there, they're also able to express a level of intensity over the course of multiple training pieces that allows them to reap the benefits of that. Um, And those two things combined are what kind of like earns you the right to train that way. And it Mm -hmm. takes a long time. You can't just go from I take affiliate class to I now train four hours a day. If you want to get there, that's a cool discussion and a, you know, glorious pursuit. But there's a has to be a progression to get there and that's why like i kind of again i was not the athlete that could do that so after three days of trying to hang with james i was like i can't feel my body i (laughs) it's it's so hard and so impressive um you know the things that he was able to do and and austin and spencer and you know all those guys that we had the pleasure of being acquainted with and friends with that lived that lifestyle well, and, and, you know, not to, not to be sexist, but like, you know, making sure we're including some of the ladies as well. Yep. You know, James's wife, Cass, and wife, yep. Ashley Wasby was in there as well. She's Savages. an absolute unit. Yep. Um, it's. All, all you, the ladies of that Reebok team from like, yeah. what was the two, the two or three years they went team? It was like 17, 18 or 16, 17, 18 that Reebok Something, did like yeah. all, all those ladies in there. Yeah. Rachel Martinez, Allie Leard. Yeah. Um, Just who am I forgetting? Uh, Kate Brearley. There we go. Oh that yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was their, there was their third. Um, yeah. Like all super savages that could every single day of the week, just make me feel like a little peanut. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> every right. day of the week. Yeah. It's when well, I think. <clears throat> so first of all, like, you know, if you are pursuing something more than, um, just coming in and crushing it like single class a day. Like you enjoy being in the gym, right? Mm-hmm. For so many people, you know, the, the, the old phrase for Starbucks was um, the guy, like, why can't I remember his name? Howard something. The, the gentleman who was the, the creator of Starbucks or the CEO of Starbucks, he wanted Starbucks to be the third place. People have their work, people have their home. He wanted the Starbucks to be the place where people go on their free time, right? And for so many people, CrossFit is that. You know, like, mm-hmm. like that's their happy hour is going and crushing a five by five back squat, you know? Yep. And like, what an amazing life choice that is and how mm-hmm. amazing that we have that as an option, or like a healthy outlet where you're gonna be supported by other people and like that deserves to be protected and needs to be protected and and then kind of, you know, to your point, depending on how you choose to spend your time at that third place, you can end up with varying levels of results depending on that level of intensity you're willing to bring to it. And 
you know, you do end up in situations where, like I know I've had athletes who are, you know, they come in and they do class and then they also subscribe to, you know, competitor training programs and they're doing those pieces as well. And, and then something like the open comes and maybe or maybe not, they have a goal for the open. And so maybe or maybe not, they are able to achieve that goal. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's like those sleeper agents, the people who just, they come in, they take class, yep. and three to five times a week, they mm -hmm. go ham. And yep. it's, it, that's it. That's all they do, right? Yep. And then the open shows up, and they've built up that willingness yep. to go ham. Yep. And so it's just now, it's a 20 minute version of that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think there's a, like two things you said there is one, they've built up. I mean, if, if you show up, like you said, the three to five days per week that you train in the gym and you're, you just given it, you're going as hard as you can push the pace, push the intensity, you're pushing yourself. You're one, you're going to build up a lot of capacity like that builds capacity. Of capacity. You're also going to build up a really, really high tolerance for pain and discomfort. And so you're going to be and maybe so not pain, but certainly discomfort. Well, just, dis, I mean, pain in the sense of like, you know, you're breathing hard, your muscle burning, not like emotional pain, pain. like you've injured you. Well, I mean, <laughs> emotional, emotional pain is after. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. <laughs> um, emotional pain is after when you see your score and you're like, well, I've you know, lost all these people. That's right. part of the emotional pain. Sure. But, um, but yes, that, that, that the, middle the, of the, the workout discomfort, discomfort of yeah. being, yeah, the, the metabolic discomfort that you feel in the, in the middle of the workout, like you build up such a tolerance for a high level of that yeah. because that's the only zone you kind of spend. <laughs> that's the only zone you're in during training is just the, that extreme level of metabolic and aerobic discomfort, that yeah. deep, deep aerobic or anaerobic, depending on the time domain state. Um, I mean, we had a member like that at One Nation. He was one of my favorite members to watch take class. His name's Connor. Um, I believe he trains at Invictus Boston now, but he, Connor only had one gear and that was go. Didn't matter how <laughs> long the workout was. If it was a five minute workout, he was done in three minutes. If it was a 20 minute AMRAP, he was done in 15 somehow. It right. would like, he only had one gear. 20 minute AMRAP, he'd finish the first round in a minute and sl and just not think twice, but get right back. I'm like, Alrighty then. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get the keep the fire extinguisher handy. Yep. Um it it was incredible. But the, every year the open came around, mm -hmm. he'd crush it. I mean, he he is that athlete that um comes in, takes class five days a week, hits it really hard, mm -hmm. takes care of some lifestyle stuff outside the gym, like cares about his nutrition and his sleep and the whole thing. Like he's he's not just staying up partying every night or eating yeah. pizza all the time. Like he he eats and sleeps and like does everything outside the gym really well as well, which there's something to be said for that. But then he comes in during the open yeah. and smashes it onto quarterfinals, you know, smashed it. Like, you know, as he's taking class and he's in like the top 1000 in North America and quarterfinals on the men's side, it's like, that's insane that you can do that. And there are probably dudes that train four times as much as Connor that can't touch him in the open or quarterfinals because they don't work out that hard, yeah. you know, that, which, yeah. you know, there, there definitely, I think, can be a balance there, but also comes down to knowing yourself. I mean, that works really well for Connor and his life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it, you know, if you have someone that far on the spectrum, I don't know if Connor would do better or worse. Mm -hmm. Come on, I'm gonna move myself. Is that an assault bike kicking on? No, that uh, we're having the water heater at the gym is getting ah. fixed, and so plumber guys up there with i don't know what um but i think you know it's really interesting this is such a nuanced conversation that i that i really enjoy because i think if you took someone like connor and you got them to train more i don't know what would happen if connor right. could maintain that level of intensity yeah. over two training pieces would that amplify his results or would you see his intensity level start to tank because you've now added volume Right. Um, because different people can take certain things. I mean, I I've learned over my trial and error periods that, you know, training with James and, and, you know, another coach and friend of mine, Lachlan, like it was, um, both of them could 
handle more volume than I could productively. Mm -hmm. And so in me trying to train with them, I kind of spent two years just kind of spinning my wheels. I didn't really get any better. didn't really get any worse. Um, but didn't, it was just too much volume for me to handle. And then when I kind of made that realization and started to adjust things and brought my volume back down, tried to bump my intensity up way higher. Then I started to see, see this like jet stream of adaptation happen where it's like, okay, now we found the happy spot. Um, and you know, for me, even though like my goal is to pursue as, as high a level of competitive CrossFit as I can. For me, that's roughly 90 minutes per day of stuff, of fitness. And, and that can look different depending on the training pieces you're doing. Um, but that's pretty much the, the sweet spot for me. If I go much more than you know, a 90 minute you know, accumulated time that could be over multiple parts of the day, depending on my schedule or in, or in one go. Um, but if I go much longer than that, I'd see very, very diminishing returns. Um, so I've, I've kind of learned that about myself as well, which I think there are some athletes who could, um, take a little bit more objective look at how much they're training. Um, you know, they can look at how much they're training, uh, what they're getting for results and what that's looking like for them. And from there, hopefully make a more educated decision on how much should I train? How is this serving me? Um, and am I using that, the time that I'm training, what I'm doing for training more productively? You know, I think there are a lot of athletes that just kind of dive into the volume route because it's what they see athletes doing on YouTube, on Instagram, you know, coming back to your reference on uh, social media and the posts there. Welcome back. Thanks, man. <laughs> just had a total oh. internet flip. Sorry, everybody. This will be interesting to see what That's it looks okay. like on the back end. That's okay. I've just been doing what I do best, which is not stopping talking. Um, I'm just kind of, I was coming back to your, your reference of um, social media and comparisons and stuff like that. And how a lot of maybe aspiring competitors or younger athletes, they see, well, this is what X athlete is doing. They're training this much. So if I want to be that fit, I need to do what they're doing. What program are they following? Okay, great. I'll do that. Um, and then they dive into the volume route without really taking a hard look at, is this serving me? And is this the most productive use of my time and my training? Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of people that fall into that camp of, they train a lot, but with limited return, just due to the fact that they're training too much for what they can handle and what their lifestyle allows. Yeah. When I, in relating that story about your athlete friend, Connor, you touched on mm-hmm. something that was really important that we all know to be important, but nobody gives it the attention that it deserves. And that's nutrition and sleep. You yep. know, so this guy, Connor, he comes in, he, he hits his workout, his one workout a day with appropriate levels of intensity. And then on the back end, he probably doesn't eat like an asshole, right? So like mm-hmm. he's paying attention. In a, in, at a level that is appropriate for a regular human being to what he is putting in his body, you know? And this is not in any way to demonize things like having a pizza or, you know, eating sushi, both of which my wife and I did this week. We had a pizza yep. one night and we ate sushi another night. And, like, it was great. And I love Fantastic. That, yeah, like, I love that. I love those things. I love food and especially the things my wife bakes, like, good Lord, it's a problem, but that's neither here nor there. It's, it's such a problem, man. Sammy right. loves baking and she'd be like, I'll come home. She'd be like, Hey, made some oatmeal chocolate cookies. I'm like, oh. all right, awesome. There's my cool. snacks for, for the right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat seven immediately. It's okay, such so a you, problem. So you understand. It's, yeah, because like, here's the thing is, is mama didn't raise no bitch. If you're going to go big, go, you got go big or go home. If I'm having a pizza, I'm eating the whole pizza. If you're yeah. having a pint of Ben and Jerry's, you make the commitment. You take off the little plastic wrapper. You take the lid off and throw it away because <laughs> I only want commitment. Like you need to be committed. If you're in it, you're in it. And yes. you know, he, like you, you either quit or finish the the pint it's you know those are only two options so amazing um I'm, well, so, I'm i'm right there with you 
So, so to that point, like, you know, like I don't beat myself up over that kind of thing because yeah, no. that works for my life goals, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I have said no to things like over volumizing in my training and, you know, two sessions a day because I have identified f for me what is important, mm -hmm. you know, like going back to a why. I know why I train. I know that I want to remain healthy and capable across the broadest possible spectrum of time that I can and stays injury free for as long as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And I bet you if you asked Connor why he trained the mm -hmm. way he does, he's going to have an answer, right? And it doesn't have to be an answer that um, is the same as mine or is the same as yours. Uh, oh, I've, I've already asked him. I already asked him. His answer was, I want to be a human weapon. There you go. Cool. So because... <laughs> like, like, I love that. But like, and that also tells you something about who yep. he is and like mm -hmm. why he does it the way that he does. Right. Yep. 100%. And, and the other thing that you talked about that I think is really important is productive training. So like, yep. and this doesn't just apply to, to training, but like in business or in work, the difference between busy and productive. Yep. Everybody knows the difference between busy and productive. And we all hopefully feel better about when we are actually productive versus when we know we're just, to use your phrase, spinning our wheel, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a more satisfying experience to know that you're making tangible progress. Um, and to understand the mechanism to, to do so. And, you know, the first couple of years that you're training, you're spinning your wheels. Maybe it's because you don't know how to not spin your wheel. Yep. And so there's a little bit of, you know, sussing out, you know, okay, what works for me? You know, what are my goals? You know, you try something for a little bit and maybe you, you pull back the reins a little bit and you try something else for a little bit and you reassess. And so having a why I don't think has to be limited to a single thing, you know, and and I've settled on my why after many years of being first uh, a CrossFitter and now a trainer. And part of it for me has to do with like professional and ethical responsibility. I will never be a competitive CrossFitter. I believe as a trainer, it is part of my responsibility to live the way I coach and live the way, like live the methodology that, that I espouse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so for those athletes, you know, if you are one of those athletes, if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, I spent two and a half hours in the gym. What of it? Okay. I don't want you to not do that. Right. But because a really, really smart person a long time ago said the unexamined life is not worth living maybe reflect ask yourself why am i doing the thing that i'm doing you know and don't take your first service surface level answer because right? you're going to respond with something and then say yeah but why but take it another or two or three levels beyond that and try to dig in a little bit um mm -hmm. and i i think man <laughs> to be a human weapon like you know, hypothetically speaking, how, because I have my own, uh, my own thoughts about this, but I have to imagine that we would have a healthier and more capable community, physically and emotionally, really, if more people spent more time asking questions like that. Oh, 100%. I, I think uh, when, when your internet decided to have a brain fart, um, I kind of touched on that a little bit is that, is that kind of hoping that some of these athletes that are just kind of like blindly jump into this training program that is four hours um, that, uh, you know, maybe having listened to this, um, taking a bit of a step back, looking at what they've been doing and like taking a real objective view. Of, okay, when did I start training this way? Yeah. And what kind of progress have I seen? If you're, if you've been training for four hours a day for two years and you've seen a five pound increase on your back squat, you are either a 
already about as strong as you can be and you've kind of reached your genetic limit or perfectly B, reasonable assessment perfectly perfectly reasonable if if that's if if that's realistic and you know mm-hmm. or you've been training so much that your body's physiological responses to the training stimulus are blunted and like you're you know i hate using the word overtraining but you're overtraining you're overdoing it you're doing too much and so kind of taking an objective look at what have I been doing for training? What have I been getting for results? And do those, does that line up? If, if the amount of effort you're putting into training or, or the amount of kind of perceived effort, we'll say you're putting into training doesn't match up or you're putting in more effort to training than like the results you're getting from it, maybe taking a step back and kind of reevaluating, yeah. you know, most people And when I say most, I mean like 99% of people Mm -hmm. should do less better, do less, put more intention, intensity behind it, and you will see more from it. Again, I, you know, we'll, we'll laugh at this, but today's episode is sponsored by James Hobart. There's a, (laughs) there's a phenomenal CrossFit journal article Uh, written by Mr. James Hobart called a deft. Yep, a deft dose of volume. Yep. Um, also, for any Google trainer, use... if you just started training, read the fucking CrossFit Journal. Love of God. That too. Yep. Um, Please and continue. so, so if if you you know use the Google machine, type it in a deft dose of volume. Deft D E F T dose of volume. You'll see it pop up on the CrossFit Journal by James Hobart. Here's what I want you guys to do. Everyone that's listening to this, you're gonna click on that article. Yep. You're gonna read it. You're going to go back and you're going to read it again. You're going to go back, look at the picture in the bottom right corner of James's calves and then read it again. <laughs> and then once you've done that and you've kind of started to let those thoughts and those things kind of marinate, cause he does, he goes into basically like, Hey, here's what training for competitive prospect can look like, Yeah. but here's like a real, like, you know, again, looking at why are you doing it? Is it going to serve you well? coming back to that level of methodology of being impressed by intensity, not volume. It doesn't matter how many workouts you're doing. If, if they're all, you know, horrible, he sure. pulls up, I, I believe it's another quote from Greg Glassman. It says, you know, um, why train for 90 minutes at 60% effort when 60 minutes at 90% effort would be way more valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, so he touches on all those things, but he also gives a really cool, like, essentially blueprint on if you do want to ramp things up, how to appropriately start to add on extra volume while still kind of like evaluating, okay, did I go too far? Is this too much? Not enough. Like kind of how to start to judge of when you as an athlete have kind of found your sweet spot um, that serves you, your lifestyle, your fitness, your goals, and kind of has all that intersect. Um, So it's a phenomenal article. Um, but I think it always comes back to him. I mean, he even says it in there that there is no replacement for intensity. And like the way you're going to get that is by working out with people. So if you're just following insert competitor program here yeah. in the corner by yourself, at your affiliate. Like you're just, you know, everyone knows the corner in their gym where like kind of yeah. open gym happens. Everyone yeah. knows that every gym has a corner. And yeah. if you go to an affiliate, you know, which corner it is. Well, we're going to talk um, about that at some point. Oh, we are. We're going to dive in on it uh, and, you know, the whole open gym concept in a later episode. But if you're just in your gym's corner by yourself, you know, just essentially checking boxes and sitting in the corner for four hours at a time, you're going to gain way more by working out with people. And for the vast majority of us, unless you're at a gym that kind of specializes in more of the competitive side of thing where you have 10, 12, 20 people that are kind of on the same path as you and have the same competitive goals that you can Mm -hmm. all train together. That can be a really cool way to kind of augment that. But for most gyms, that's not the case. And the way you're going to get the intensity that you need is by working out with other people. And for most of us, that means taking class. I know I said it. Competitors should take class. Absolutely. How dare I? Wild. Um, But working out with people and hitting that intensity is going to be the key to unlocking the fitness that you want or wish you had um training for four hours ad nauseum without really much of a why isn't the answer well and i 
So kind of twofold thing. First of all, I think it would be a fantastic idea for, for the next episode for us to both go back, read that article, and then to bring some of those things forward into that discussion. Why less is better and things like that. Yep. The other thing that I wanna I wanna say and I wanna be clear is James Hobart does James Hobart has zero economical interest interest in you reading this article. <laughs> no. This is out there for free. He's not yep. trying to sell you a program. He's not nope. trying to discourage you from buying mm -hmm. other people's programs. What he's doing is providing you with an understanding from the perspective of both a subject matter expert in the CrossFit methodology and also a multi-time games competitor. Has been to and competed at a high level at the CrossFit Games more times than almost mm -hmm. anybody, right? Yeah. And that's he's a got very three very, gold medals. Right? Like at one time he was the winningest games athlete ever because of the number of times he had been on teams and had placed at the games. Yeah. Um, there's a very narrow group of people who fill both the subject matter and the CrossFit Games experience bubble. And this mm -hmm. is the guy. And so you have a person who is invested not in receiving money from you, but in helping you to understand and make better choices for your health and well-being while also hopefully pursuing this thing that gives you some, some satisfaction from a competitor standpoint. So yes, absolutely go out and do it. I'll put a link to the article in the show notes if you're on uh, Spotify or Google or Apple, Apple Podcast. Uh, and I think that's great homework for both of us to do is to go yep. back, reread, come back and talk about it a little bit next week. It's, it's one of my favorite journal articles and, and exactly what you said. He's not trying to discourage people from competing in CrossFit. He's not trying to discourage you from kind of pushing for your goals by tacking on some, some extra work here and there. He just gives a really good insight on, you know, because again, he is that person that has trained a whole lot, done more volume than not, um, and, and really achieved everything you can at the highest level. Um, he's given you like a blueprint of like, okay, if, if you, if you were that athlete that you're like, okay, I've been, I've been doing CrossFit for a while. I want to push for a little bit more. Here's how to smartly and appropriately start to add on these extra things to move the needle without absolutely, you know, putting yourself six foot under every day. Um, so I, it's, it's an, a, one of my favorite articles from the journal for sure. Yeah. yeah. And also again, because it deserves to be said, not reading the CrossFit Journal or you haven't cracked the CrossFit Journal, do yourself a favor and go, especially if you're a trainer, for the love mm -hmm. of God, go read the CrossFit Journal. You've got 20 years, close to 20 years of the collected writings of some of the smartest people in the CrossFit methodology. The great majority of the articles early on written by Greg Glassman himself, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a worthwhile investment of your time to understand CrossFit's history and why we do some of the things that we do the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a good amount of some, like, not necessarily just like written articles, but also some videos in there of oh, yeah. lectures from seminars from what, and from all subject matter experts, whether it's, you know, clips from level one seminars, clips from nutrition seminar, clips from powerlifting, weightlifting, mm -hmm. um, aerobic capacity, uh, you know, all sorts of different. And I, I think there's even some clips from uh, uh, when, I don't know if he still does them, but Ben Bergeron used to do, uh, yeah. uh, I believe, affiliate excellence um, yeah. seminars, and so there's like clips from that in there as well. I mean, it's like you, you, it's the CrossFit Journal is a vast resource. Mm -hmm. I hope they start po start posting there again and like having, but there seems to have been since their media staff has fluctuated is <laughs> the the term I'll, I'll use. It's a it's a very safe word that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> since their media staff has fluctuated. Um, I think the last post in there, the last article posted was in December of 2018. I believe you're right. Um, it's about the GHD. I so, yeah, I, I'm, I believe you are right as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope they start putting some stuff in there and writing some articles. That would be pretty slick. Because it's good stuff. It is. Kevin, I think this is, a, this is a fantastic exploration of this topic, and I love the suggestion to, mm -hmm. to read the article. So you and I will both go off, and we'll do that, and we'll return. And for anyone who wants mm -hmm. to party along with us, Again, I'll include the link to the article in the show notes. It's not, we're not talking about a 30 page white paper. I think it's like three pages long. I think, yeah, I think it's like three pages. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very direct in typical CrossFit style. So mm -hmm. uh, as always, thank you so much, sir, for being a part of this uh, journey and for helping to shepherd me and 
<laughs> between now and next week, continue to kick ass. I hope the hip starts to feel better and you can start to do some more nasty stuff. Um, trying, trying my best. I hear um, you. Yeah. Hope. Thanks. Thanks for being on this journey with me and also shepherding me along this journey. And we'll we'll both shepherd each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amen, we'll brother. Talk next week. Next week it is. All right. See you, everybody.